Just Young. How you doing? Good, Becca. The Offspring. How's it going, Becca? Dave Grohl. How you going, mate? Good, man. Pete, it's been a long time coming. Oh, Becca, hasn't it indeed? We go inside the dressing room, speak to the biggest names in music. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. And crack open their esky. This is exactly how I imagined you, by the way, sitting opposite me with a vodka and orange. You're a discerning chap. This is The Rider. Hey, it's Becco. Welcome back to The Rider. And last week was a big one, and it went right around the world. A chat with Mark Opitz, who's produced so many iconic Aussie albums from ACDC's Power Rage to Cold Chisels East and even In Excess. He has done it and seen it all. And if you missed that chat, go back and catch up now on all platforms. Also, if you missed it, Simple Minds are back with a brand new album. You can catch my chat with Jim Kerr as well. Next week on the podcast, it's going to be season three going out with a bang. The one and only Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses, The Cult, and for a number of years has been working with a band called Kings of Chaos with a number of different lineups over the years. They're finally releasing a debut single. That is next week on The Rider. But this week, the guy behind so many great Aussie music festivals, Chris O'Brien. The man behind Good Things Festival, which is coming up in just a few weeks' time with these guys coming out, NoFX, and Tism, back after 19 years. And of course, for many years, uh, Chris O'Brien worked with Soundwave Festival. I want to look back on a couple of those great Soundwave lineups. First of all, 2010 was Face No More. With Paramore, I was there in a stinking heat of Eastern Creek. And then 2011, Iron Maiden. Queens of the Stone Age also on the lineup. 2012. System of a Down. Bush. Slipknot, that was pretty incredible, but also 2015, Soundgarden, Smashing Pumpkins, there is so much to cover with Chris O'Brien over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, so many great memories of, of going out and seeing Soundwave grow from Humble beginnings, really, in, in, in 2007, uh, up to a, a just a massive festival. And then, of course, uh, the final year taking over the last big day out. There's a lot to cover. Chris O'Brien is uh, popping up right now on my screen. There he is. Chris, how are you? Delightful, Becco. Delightful. How are you going? Mate, doing well. First of all, congratulations. Uh, a sellout for Melbourne for good things. I mean, that's, that's huge. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's... Um well, well, we certainly didn't expect it this year, but it sort of got out of the blocks really strongly and, you know, the feedback to the lineup was was pretty immense and it just seems to have struck a chord at the right time, I think. it's um, A lot of other festivals seem to be struggling, but, um, yeah, this one's hit the mark pretty nicely. I can't imagine the, the challenges you guys have been facing um, behind the scenes, you know, of, um, booking bands, but also, I guess, the insurance costs as well with you know, cancellations and COVID and everything, it, it, it must have just blown up since COVID. Oh, well, yes, yeah, since COVID it has. Yeah, I mean, look, there's certainly been roadblocks everywhere we've gone, that's for sure. Insurance companies aren't making it easy and, um, well, nothing's easy putting on festivals these days, to be honest. So, But, um, but we're finding a way through and navigating through the murky waters so at this stage it's um everything's everything's okay but we've got an incredible team behind us so it makes our jobs uh, a little bit easier yeah yeah and i've got a bunch of mates who are really excited about seeing no effects that's going to be uh you know really huge for people who grew up in the 90s and you know skated and surfed mm. and everything <laughs> there's definitely a branding on that festival for sure i mean for me it was i mean i just love booking bands that i love as well but it, i think for that for that band you know, sort of, you know, mid to late nineties. You know, I used to run a punk club in Melbourne, and they were one of the staples of it. And, and punk and drum at the time was, you know, everyone had it on pretty high rotation. So, and it meant a lot to people at the time. So, you know, when you can sort of get convinced bands to do these albums in full, the memories just come sort of flooding back for people. So, also, tell me about getting Tism on the lineup, Chris, because that was such a big deal. <laughs> so many people. Yeah, that was. That, that was a real bucket list moment. I, oh, I certainly never expected it to happen. I, I, I had lunch with their manager back in 
oh, it's probably mid last year, maybe around August or something like that. And it was just a general catch up, actually. It had nothing to do with the band. And we were just chatting, and I didn't even bring it up in conversation. He just sort of mentioned, oh, look, you know, the band's always had offers to reunite, but it'll never happen. And I sort of just dismissed him, and oh, yeah, fair enough. And maybe probably three months later, I was just sitting at home and had a glass of wine on the couch and whatever I was watching, and the idea popped into my head. I thought, well, <clears throat> I might just send him a text message and offer them some money and see if they're interested. And the phone rang about 30 seconds later and he said, well, you've, you've got my interest, let's chat. So the initial conversation sparked from there and oh, it took months to get the deal done, to be honest. The band were incredibly protective about their legacy and which they have every right to be. So, um, yeah, it took a lot of convincing and a lot of twisting of arms. But in the end, yeah, the, the band were... I think the stars just aligned, to be honest, for whatever reason. Maybe it was post-COVID. Um, it just seemed to align really beautifully. So, yeah, when they officially confirmed, it was oh, absolute career highlight. It was um, really interesting working uh, at um, Melbourne at, at Triple M and Fox down there because someone in that building is in TISM. And a few people in the building knew, but not everyone knew. So what happened is they had a TISM interview, I think, on Martin Malloy, um, at four o'clock or whatever. So he had to go out, leave the building, go to his car, get in the character and get changed and then return to the building and go in for the interview and no one had any idea. <laughs> it was certainly a time <laughs> just to keep in character. They're an incredible bunch of people to work with. You, you really just have no idea what you're getting yourself into and I sort of promised myself, I thought, you know what, it doesn't just expect the absolute unexpected with this band, just just go along for the ride, it'll be what it'll be, and true to their form, all the press they've done has been, um, <laughs> been pretty hilarious, so it's, 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 look, it's just nice seeing them enjoying being back in the spotlight again and, and enjoying the process of, you know, getting all their costumes made up and preparing the show and... I keep getting sent sketches of what the show is going to look like and I think it's going to blow some people's minds, which is super exciting. I want to go back to the beginning now. So let's go into yeah. the 90s band scene and long before Soundwave happened, you were actually working with mm-hmm. bands and you were saying, you know, the punk scene down there. Um, you managed the Mavises as well, which I didn't know until recently. <clears throat> yeah, I was – yeah, probably what was that, maybe late 90s. I was managing Body Jar – Area 7 and the Mavises and a couple of other acts. So it it sort of just came out of nowhere, really. It, it, I just sort of got contacted by their agents and then one of the band members called me and said, would you like to meet up? And I thought, yeah, okay, sure. So we sort of just sat down in Becky's lounge room in St Kilda and did the deal that day pretty much. So I think they liked what I had to say and I obviously loved the band. And I think it took me out of my comfort zone a little bit as well because I'd been used to working with sort of heavier acts and, um, you know, to have such a, an incredible pop act with so much talent uh, under my wing was, yeah, it was, was a super exciting time in my life. Yeah, it would have been a big change because, yeah, you were in a, in a really heavy scene leading up to that. How would you fall into the music scene? Was it one of those stories where it's a bit of an accident and you're just hanging out in the you know, seeing bands and all of a sudden you're managing someone. Is that how it happened? Well, I grew up out of, just out of Colac, about 10 minutes out of Colac. So, you know, my parents weren't really into music that much. You know, mum loved Elvis and the Beatles and things like that, but it wasn't a, a heavy musical household. I probably more got that through my uncle, but who loved Johnny Cash and Slim Dusty. So a bit of a love of country music when I was really little, but uh, it was probably... It was just one day I was in a – we lived just down a dirt track in the middle of nowhere and our nearest neighbour was probably a couple of hundred metres away and I just heard this music blaring from their house one day and jumped on the old BMX and pedalled over and knocked on the door and she answered and I said, oh, what's going on in there? And she said, oh, the kid's cousin's down from Geelong listening to some bloody heavy music and he won't stop it. So I buzzed into the house and sat down and just said, what's – what's going on in here? Who's this band? And he goes, oh, it's a band called Iron Maiden. And so I just sat there for like two hours listening to Iron Maiden with him and just couldn't believe what I was hearing because I'd never heard anything like it before in my life. So I raced back home and said to mum, you've got to drive me into Colac like the next day and went to Mark Sherry Records and Tapes and bought Seventh Son of a Seventh Son on cassette. <laughs> and 
And then that was it. So I was probably maybe 15, I think, at the time. And then early the next year, you, you go into year 10 and do your um, work experience. And you only had certain categories you could do back then. It was accounting and lawyer and bank and all the usual stuff. And I said, no, no, I want to work at the local radio station. And the school actually refused, flat out refused to allow wow. me to do it because they said, they said there's no career in music, we're not allowing it. And that's where the, the real love of music came because I get to li- listen to all the new music that would come into the station every day. So it was all white label stuff and anything they didn't play, I could take home. So it was everything from you know, Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses and, you know, a lot of the sort of glam stuff coming out of LA at the time. And so, yeah, I just filled up my boots with as much music as I could get hold of and off we went. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know you came from a, a radio background. And I could definitely vouch for the fact that um, uh, there's no future in music uh, or radio. <laughs> 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 well, man, it, it, that's so cool. I mean, it, it often is one of those things you, you do fall into, and, and and sometimes I can imagine you um just just go with it and see what happens, and um and before you know it, you're managing bands in Melbourne and getting part of the scene. Now, did you, did you get to see? Uh, uh, did you get to meet Iron Maiden down the track? Uh, I I did. It was 2011. We had them on Soundwave, so uh, the band came out here and. It was probably more meeting with with Rod, their their long term manager. It yeah. was probably a bit of a highlight, and being backstage with him and having conversations, and I actually told him the story of how I got into music, which he loved, and um, and then we we toured Bruce Dickinson solo uh, a few years ago now, and he came out and did his his solo um, like it was like a talk, like a speaking tour, and yeah, yeah. so I just went on the whole tour, and it was great because Bruce was just. I don't want anything Maiden related here. I don't want – just give me a platter of sandwiches, make sure there's a couple of beers backstage. I don't want any entourage. So he literally came out here on his own and we just put him on planes, just had a driver with him and just drove around with him and he was happy to tell stories and what an incredible human being that guy is, just the most down-to-earth person and he'd give you all the time in the world, and which was a relief because I thought, well, they're the band that got me into music, so – you don't want to find out that your heroes are not nice people, and but he he couldn't have been a more outstanding person. And I did tell him the, the story as well of how I got into it. So he ended up signing me a poster saying "From One Seventh Son to Another" at the oh. end of it, which was nice. So it was pretty cool. That's oh mate, that's great. And and just to put the pen on paper on a contract to get Maiden to come for Soundwave must have been such a big deal for you. It is something nice about meeting your idols and end up being way, way nicer than you ever expect. In fact, Maiden weren't that extravagant when I got to see them and, and got to see how the, the tour went. They just knew what they were doing and there was nothing too crazy. Yeah, I think for a lot more of those, the seasoned professional artists, you know, backstage is, well, it's it's a working area effectively. Uh, it's, it's really down to business and, you know, the crews are so big as well. Everything's got to be finally tuned to a point so there's there's not a huge amount going on generally speaking so it's um you know i mean look some bands do it better than others that's for sure depending on their crew and their personalities but but yeah maiden are um yeah absolutely top shelf yeah but you're right about rod too like like meeting rod is like meeting someone bigger than the whole band almost because he created the band really <laughs> i mean you know and, and you see it with the fans they go up and shake his hand and they're just as excited to meet the manager of Iron Maiden as they are meeting Bruce Dickinson. It's it's, it's pretty crazy. You know, you've, you've formed an incredible legacy as a manager, if, yeah, as you rightly said, if you're as popular as the band themselves almost. So, especially to those hardcore fans that know, you know. Yeah. So, and yeah. I think the band would admit as well that they wouldn't have got to the levels they got to without the guidance of someone like Rod. So, he's, he's just the perfect picture of what an ideal manager should be. To tour with Bruce, and did you talk about planes? I got in his trust zone um, sitting by a pool with a cocktail when I mentioned Boeing 737s, and he was he just sort of went from there. <laughs> we just did plane chat with Bruce Dickinson. Look, he's hard to stop talking when he starts, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and nothing's off limits with him. So he's just as happy listening to your life and what your passions and interests are as much as he is talking about his own, I found. So um, he was super interested in you know, how I got into music and, you know, how we got into creating and forming Soundwave and, you know, why did I stop managing bands for a while and then get back into it? And so, yeah, just it's refreshing when you 
talk to people like that, that it's not just all about them, even though you want it to be, because all you want to do is just shut up and just listen to what they've got to say. So it's, um, but it was refreshing. Yeah. Now, tell me about the moment you met AJ, because uh, there's, there's so much history with AJ over the years with, with Sam White. Yeah. And I described your relationship as good cop, bad cop. <laughs> and I don't know how accurate <laughs> that was, but that's how I described <laughs> it. Yeah. Would have been 95, maybe late 95. I was, you know, I was running the punk clubs and we had bands playing and it was quite a successful club. We had like a thousand capacity band room downstairs and a 600 capacity nightclub upstairs. And yeah, the, it didn't matter who we had on a Friday night, it would just sell out. We'd set a $5 door. And, but we had everyone from Mill and Colin and Blink 182 and No Fun at All play. And, and so it became this sort of hot spot for any international artist to play. And AJ had just started touring internationals, but only doing like one or two a year. So it was pretty small. And he had an act come through. And I was helping out a friend of mine called Dave Batty who was promoting some artists. So I was looking after their Melbourne shows for them and just helping them promote the shows. And AJ had heard about it and hit me up at one of the shows and said, would you be interested in coming on board and helping me out? And I said, sure. So I think it was April 96, he toured this Canadian hardcore band called Strife. And that was the first time we ever worked together. So I looked after the Melbourne shows and... The band only wanted to perform all ages. They, they refused to play 18 Moba shows. So I think that it, it worked well because I got thrown in the deep end because I had to try and find a, a venue for them. So I booked them at Story Hall, I think at RMIT Uni from memory, and I had to do a deal with the, the university because I'd never had a band perform before and it became this whole thing. And at the end of the tour, I think AJ grabbed me and just said, look, thanks so much for all your hard work and I'd love to keep working together. So I just sort of snowballed from there i suppose it was it was only sort of more two or three tours a year for the first few years and then we just got on like a house on fire and had a lot in common and um yeah it just just grew from there and your first sound wave was it 2003 it was called the gravity games actually in perth um which was uh, partly funded by the wa government and the idea was i think we had grinspoon on and a few others, and then we had, God, my memory, it might have been Real Big Fish and MXPX, I think, and Unwritten Law. And so that was the first one. It was called Gravity Games Soundwave. And then it did quite well for two years, and then we sort of thought, oh, we had all these internationals out here, but we were feeding the big day out, our heavy acts each year. Right. And we sort of thought, yeah. well, why are, we, why are we feeding them all the heavy acts? Why can't we just put on something ourselves? So that's where the idea was was sort of born out of and then around 2007 we decided to have a crack at it and it did better than we expected and yeah it just it grew it just grew so quickly so quickly we, it was just it was like hanging on for dear life because we had no experience in putting on festivals really we'd been involved in them but not putting them on yourself and we didn't have a team it was literally AJ me and a guy called Darren Hawthorne, who was our tour manager. And that was it. It's not like we had an army of people sitting in an office. So you were just, you were just micromanaging every piece of it because you had no choice. So how the hell we got away with it <laughs> in those early years, I really don't know. We'd, we'd get to the end of the festivals and just be absolutely write-offs. Just you were so exhausted. And um, the main focus was making sure the bands left the country all safe and sound. The punters had a great time and... You just did whatever you could do to to put the show on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I can't imagine how that was without a big team. I mean, we know how big the Big Day Out team was at their absolute peak, and I don't think we'll ever see those big festival years of that scale really ever again. Unfortunately, look, I think the days of the, the monolith, yeah, the monolithic festival is gone, as in the amount of bands you can put on them. Mm. I mean, I think at one point we almost tipped a hundred acts on Soundwave one year, and. It's just not sustainable financially at that level. It costs, even back then, it was a lot of money to bring these artists out and then you've got to pay for all their internals, like, the, you know, freight and ground transport and accommodation and yeah. flights and food. And um, But it's so much more expensive now. But like, everything's gone through the roof. Like, freight's gone through the roof, all your prices, petrol. So it's just not, it's not workable. I mean, good things is probably... 
I mean, that's five stages. That's a double main, double second, and a, and a fifth. So I think that's probably as, as big as it can probably get, I would have thought. Um, and and I, don't, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't have any vision to grow it a lot bigger than what it already is, to be honest, because I've been there and I know how it's not even time-consuming. It's just it, it consumes your entire life. Like you, for the moment the festival finishes, you're, you're working on the next year. Like there is no reprieve at all when you get to that that higher end level of running massive festivals. It's you know even when you're t- trying to take a break and a holiday and you know one year we went to we had a break overseas in Europe somewhere and I <clears throat> uh, went over there with AJ and his wife and my wife and <laughs> we ended up just spending most of the days just talking about bands and how to book the next year and. So it just you just didn't really get that break, which when you're in the middle of it, you don't think about. I suppose you're just going with the flow. But mm. you know, looking back at it, it's yeah. As much as it was a great experience, I don't really want to go through that again, where it just takes over your entire life because you just had no balance. And you have that sort of publicity um, thing as well. Like, and I know everyone was sort of obviously checking on AJ's Twitter account um, leading up to lineups coming out and is the next year going to actually happen and, and people would read into mm. tweets from him and yeah you must have been exhausted by the time they came out oh you were i mean the, the, the amount of work that went into it uh, and even at its peak we didn't have that big a team i mean we probably had I'm trying to think i reckon maybe five full-time staff probably something like that and then you just have an army of people that were subcontracting and doing all that but really we probably only had five and you know to run an event of that size it's pretty hard to think back and imagine we only did it with that amount of people so but i think the great thing about it is it's so much respect was gained and how hard we all worked that those five people are still with me today working with working with me with destroyer lines and good things so which is a really comforting thing for all of us because we all know each other so well. We know how we work. So when moments pop up of stress and we've been through so much worse, we just sort of laugh it off, really. <laughs> the very last sound wave, which from memory didn't didn't actually get off the ground, I guess. Um, how did you sort of both walk away uh, from that? Oh, look, it was tough. It was a it was a pretty a pretty dark time. I think he'd be the first to admit that and um, sort of mistakes that were made and but. You know, for me, it was about making sure all the staff got out okay and got all their entitlements, and and then it was weird. We just kept whittling. I mean, I knew it was coming a long time before it was announced, obviously. So it was just a matter of making sure everyone got looked after. And then the office, I'll never forget it, the office eventually sort of dwindled down to two of us, and there was my assistant and... She said, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving you. I said, just go. It's okay. It's fine. I said, it'll be fine. So she left and then there was probably about another three weeks, I think, or four weeks of just I'd still go into the office each day and just sort of sit there on my own and there was still work to do, but I knew what was coming. And I was still talking to AJ every day and then it was just more working out a a strategy of what he was going to try and do with it. And when it happened, it was fuck. Just the surrealist moment ever, you know. I probably didn't speak to him for uh, probably about a month, I reckon. But it wasn't through lack of trying. Like, there was no animosity towards him from my end. So um, it just went dark and he just turned his phone off and I took a bit of time off and then the phone started ringing about other opportunities and I just said, oh, I just don't have the headspace for this now. I don't really want to dive back into Music, I just need some time off. So I eventually got hold of him about a month later and, yeah, he just went through a really dark period. So, but, you know, we're still in regular contact, regular contact. So we don't see each other as much, but, yeah, probably once a fortnight we'll be on the phone just chatting about stuff and every now and then, you know, he'll talk about regrets and decisions made, but it's, you know, that's that's all in the past. So he's... Uh, He's fit and healthy again, which is which is the main. Thing. Yeah, and I think he'd be proud too. Looking at good things right now, and it seems to have that sound wave DNA. Yeah, look, he has mentioned it a, a couple of times to me. I think he calls me his little pad one. But um, <laughs> it's uh, you know, and if you're going to learn from someone, it's you know, talk about the ability to 
curate a festival and, um, you know, Soundwave was a bit different because we had so many acts on, whereas Good Things, you have to be, it's a bit more tailored, so you've got to be more careful with your selections and, and bands complementing each other and making sure there's enough on there for, for people to be excited about going. So trying to find those bucket list moments is probably a lot more of a challenge. So, you know, trying to find that tism angle or, as we've touched on, no effects doing punk and drublick or just things like that, things that people just won't expect. So I think they're the things he seems to be, yeah, the most proud of. Well, there was one a few years ago which I think has um, brought back a love of this pop group, and I'm talking about the Veronicas because you put them on the lineup, and yeah. and they have actually um, you know come out since then and they've, they've thanked you for that because in a way the Veronicas are going through a renaissance, you know, and and who would have thought? And it's all because they out of nowhere ended up on on good things, and it feels like that gave them some some life. It was an interesting conversation because I, when I sort of contacted the, the band, they were actually in the, in the middle of changing their agents. So I was dealing with one agent and then it went really quiet. I thought, oh, okay, maybe they're not interested. And then I get a call out of the blue about a week later saying, oh, no, the band's just sacked their agent and they've got a new one. So, oh, right. So I'd known this guy for a long time and just said I'm really interested in them and, you know, I think they'll work perfectly at the festival and, you know, you, you've got to remember they sort of started out really almost as an emo act. So... You know, a lot of kids that were into email at the time were, were loving the Veronicas, and sure, they moved on to other bands. But I think when people have those moments of time in their lives, when you, when a certain act or a certain album means a lot to them, they'll never lose that. It doesn't matter what styles of music they go on to; they'll always have that there. So, if you can put a, an act like that on the festival and then curate some other acts around them to give those people a reason to go then it's just a great fun day. And that's that was the sell to their team, which was you're not going to – I'd never put you in a position where I thought you'd be a laughing stock. You know, I, the only reason I'm coming to you is because I think you'll be brilliant for the festival and it's going to be brilliant for you. I'm going to put you on main stage. You're going to be mid-afternoon and I'm going to pay you what what your fee is. I'm not going to argue with you about it. So I, I think it was – I think they just liked the honesty. So, um, yeah. And I got along with the girls really well through the festival and their management team. So, yeah, I, when they when that Facebook group started, the Veronica's Wall of Death, that was certainly not a publicity stunt on our side. That was as organic as it gets. Wow. And then when that happened, I just knew we the, the absolute right decision was made and that the heavy community had embraced the band. And, you know, and the girls even produced T-shirts with – Veronica's Wall of Death on the back. Like it was, and they embraced it as well. So it worked, um, it worked really well. It was a master stroke. That's, that's how it felt to me. <laughs> but certainly since then, <laughs> it's really been one of those great moments. <laughs> and oh, now they're on um, when, um, when We Were Young as well, which is at that huge festival you know, in, in Vegas, mm. which has got one of the biggest lineups I've seen in my life. But um, so, you know, you've given that, that just a, a bit more life and, um, and they're going on to bigger and better things now. That's exciting for them. For any act, I mean, no one wants to be pigeonholed, do they? So, oh. you know, I, th- I think it just takes a little bit of courage sometimes from an agent, a manager or a promoter or the artist themselves to say, you know what, do we ha- why do we have to keep playing the same festivals all the time? Why can't we do this? And Or why can't we create our own one? Or, um, you know, Parkway Drive is an incredible example of an act that just did things their way and wouldn't take no for an answer and, you know, look where they are now. Yeah, well, I saw them the Australian story, and uh, I, I remember being there for uh, their show. I think it was the 2019 or 2018. Um, good things, and, mm. and the amount of pyro in that show. <laughs> My God, how did you pull that off? Yeah, look. So at the time, you know, when we were booking them, I wanted them to be the headlining act, and they didn't want to play any other. They had a bad experience at a music festival quite a few years ago and they'd they'd always swore we're not going to play an Australian music festival again unless we're the, the actual headliner, and which was fair enough too. But I don't think anyone had given them a chance. So, And I loved them and for a long time and, and knew how popular they were and thought, well, let's start the conversation. You know, I'm happy to book you, happy to have you as the headliner, but, you know, you're going to need to put on a show and they – that was that was it. I said, "Well, we'll put on the show, all right." So, I was, from there, it was just getting the two production teams together to work out how much of the show we could actually produce. 
we it, it wasn't even their full shot. It was close, but you know we've only got X amount of stage capacities out here as well, and um, production's okay. But um, but yeah, look, they put on an incredible show, and you know I hope for them it was a a career highlight out here because they'd never done anything that big before. You've done some great moments over the years. Um, many bands you've, you've created the great culture backstage as well. Are there any bands you actually wouldn't bring out again because they were just such a pain in the ass? It's all about partnerships and relationships, and and you must think mm-hmm. I, I can't be bothered doing that. Yeah, look, there are some, um, and and look on the flip side, there are some agents that I refuse to deal with as well because I don't like the way they operate, and you know they're too much stress and too much of a headache and too much of an ego and. Um, I just look at it and think, well, there's a lot of artists out there. I just want to work with people that I respect. You know, it's not like we're friends. We're colleagues. We work together in partnership with the artists and all we want to do is build their careers out here. So how do we do it? What's the longer-term vision for these acts? And they're the, they're the people I want to work with. And, yeah, there's been a number of experiences through more Soundwave specifically where it's more the acts of the – some of the acts of the pointy and who have the egos that – um just put it in the too hard basket and you know and look a lot of it comes down to acts to complain about billing and where they where they're placed on the poster and um they're the conversations i hate having so it's like just park your ego you know we're going to put you on the festival you're going to play to x amount of people it's great for your career and i've had some bands just go well unless we're one spot high we're not coming out and god you know i'm like well then don't come out i can imagine you know a couple of those bands would have been you know humongous billings and uh, for you to draw the line somewhere and say, okay, let's uh, let's walk away from this before the lineup comes out, it, it must have been incredibly frustrating because some of those bands you would have loved to have had on that poster. Oh, absolutely, 100%. But, um, you know, you've got to draw the line in the sand at some point. Otherwise, not just that artist, but that agent or that management company, they'll just walk all over you every time. If they think they can get away with it once, they'll get away with it twice. So... Um, as much as you want certain acts on your on your on your festivals, there's some that just aren't worth the arguments with, and you know there's a, there's a line, you know, ten deep behind them actually what you want to play. So, you know, why put yourself through so much stress if you don't need to? You might have to help me out with this one because I, I remember Big Day Out and and Soundwave wrapped up. C three bought the name or the rights to to big day out off memory is there a chance those brands could return one day or, or is that it oh look i think there's potentially always a chance but i would highly doubt it um you know i think that i think the, the people that were involved in the big day big day out organizations have certainly obviously with ken's passing but yeah um have certainly all moved on and the key players that were in that organization i do speak to regularly and that that was a really tumultuous time. That you know, because we got involved in the big day out in its last year, and which I was dead against. But you know, I remember flying up to Sydney to their offices and just walking in, and I just I don't think I'd ever seen a building filled with people that had just checked out mentally and physically and emotionally more in my life. It was just you know they just did not want to be there. So. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd highly – again, you need those people. You know, like it, it, running festivals is not as easy as what people think. You can't just throw bodies at it. You've got to have highly experienced teams that have done it over a long period of time involved in it. So I, I'd, I'd highly doubt that those people would want to get back involved in it. Of course, that's me speaking on their behalf. But, but, but knowing what they all went through and, you know, and they've all moved on to other – parts of their lives and some are still in the industry some aren't and you know so and and for us you know the the sound wave teams you know that we built up over such a long time are pretty much at destroy all lines and and good things now yeah well um it, it carries on and we can't wait for the summer ahead um you know, you've got to sell out in Melbourne. It's going to be huge in Sydney as well uh, for good things and it's just an incredible lineup and before we go you must have a writer because even, you know, the guys side of stage and management, you've got to have something in your esky. What is in your esky <laughs> which you have when you're running around on stage? Got to have my snakes. I love my snakes. Um, pretty boring when it comes to the writer. I think you're so busy. Uh, there's always got to be some cold beers for the end of the night. Um, you know, 
bottle of Jack, something like that normally. Or, But I think the way the festivals run, because they're back to back to back, it's it's pretty exhausting. And so, you, you know, you might be getting offside at, say, 1 a.m., but then you've, you know, you've got like a 4.30 a.m. wake-up call to get to the airport to fly to the next city. So it's more the... Um, the before party in Melbourne and the after party in Melbourne is where you can get a bit more involved in it. And um, but yeah, like on stage, yeah, it's just <laughs> waters and Gatorades normally, and whatever you can get into yourself as you're sort of running around madly around the site. Totally get it. <laughs> it says there's no time for party. Hey, Chris, look, it's so good to nah. catch up. We've had a great relationship Thanks, over man. the years, and I've been dying to get you on the podcast. And um, I'll make sure I see you there in Sydney for the the next show. We can't wait. Um, and look, um, Love it, Becca. Stay well. I'll, I'll see you soon. Thanks for all your support, mate. Much appreciated. There he is, concert promoter. Bloody good bloke too. Chris O'Brien on the rider. And yes, I will be there for good things coming up December 3 and around the country. December 3 in Sydney. Next week, wrapping up season 3 with the one and only Matt Sorum. You know him from the cult. Guns N' Roses. He's performed in Slash's Snake Pit. And more recently, Kings of Chaos and a brand new album to come. We'll catch Matt Sorum next week. This is The Rider with Beko.